The paper will be presented uh, by Eftimos uh, uh, Lizopulu, uh, who is um, uh, a postdoc research fellow uh, in the Center for Global Finance uh, here at SOAS, uh, and uh, has been uh, working with me in this particular uh, on this particular uh, project uh, and paper, and I will try to see the extensions. It's work in progress, and so we require a lot of um, uh, discussion, brainstorming, and uh, to, press, uh, to explore some uh, important aspects, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, it's structured around the flow of funds, so it has applications for uh, companies, uh, banks, uh, uh, you know, uh, governments, uh, and uh, households. Um, this uh, seminar will be chaired uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Jun Hong Hong, uh, who is uh, a senior lecturer in uh, the uh, School of Finance and Management uh, here at SOAS. Uh, so uh, let me invite Jun Hong uh, to take up uh, uh, the chair of chairing uh, this session uh, this afternoon. Uh, Jun Hong. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I think uh, uh, Rita is open this session already. So uh, what I think be easier for me and uh, just you know, uh, chair uh, the, in the rest of the part. Um, I think uh, in this in this session, I think uh, uh, Thames is going to be talk about uh, his paper about fintech and the opportunity and the risk. And I think um, probably going to talk about uh, an hour and a half. Yeah. So we're going to have uh, another in the at, at the, then you can put your comments in the chat. Then later on, we're going to have a and a sessions. So uh, we're going to uh, then, then uh, famous going to be answer your questions. And then you can also at the end, you can, you can also raise your hand. Then I will be, uh, you know, give the opportunity for the uh, famous to answer all your questions. So um, no, I think um, um, this, before I think now is uh, about the time we can start this uh, seminar. I think these are uh, these fintech revolutions and what are the opportunities and risk. It sounds very very interesting to me, and I hope uh, uh, they're going to be uh, also. Um, you know, we can learn a lot for this 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 uh, seminar and also for uh, uh, famous research. Um, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jun Hong. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, well, this is the paper uh, I co-author uh, with uh, Victor Morite. Um, he's, um, as already was mentioned, is about uh, the fintech revolution. What are the opportunities and, and risks? Uh, it is a survey paper uh, based on a variety of uh, sources from academic journals, um, to reports and surveys from uh, international institutions such as uh, the World Bank, uh, the IMF, the Bank of International Settlements. Um, what we, we we try in this to do in this paper is to provide a, a comprehensive summary of all the um, um, relevant and uh, recent issues um, regarding uh, uh, fintech uh, in the. Uh, Flow of funds framework. So we try to consider the opportunities and risks for households, the firms, the banks, and the government. And we also look into regulatory issues and uh, the, the, this uh, question of governance of a fintech. And um, at the end, we try to to identify some promising uh, research uh, ideas. Uh, what we think and we hope is this paper is a good basis and um, a starting point for uh, those researchers that want to investigate fintech, but also for market uh, uh, practitioners and uh, policy uh, makers to get a, just an idea uh, of um, a, a brief idea about uh, fintech. Now, although fintech has been um, a relatively recent uh, term, uh, technology has been uh, in finance for 100, almost 155 uh, years. And uh, well, the, the first, uh, if you want, uh, techn technological development 
in uh, finance was in, in 1965 with the Pandelic Graph um, in order to verify the signatures uh, of uh, banking uh, transactions. Uh, and then uh, later, uh, one year later, uh, after the introduction of the Telegraph, we have the first, uh, if you want, uh, successful installation of the transatlantic cable, which uh, set the stage for um, a globalization um, of um, uh, finance. Then uh, moving forward, um, we have uh, other developments uh, in uh, the uh, next uh, decade, such as the Fed, Fed Wire Fund service, um, a service that would allow the, uh, the Fed, federal banks um, in US uh, to uh, transfer funds uh, and connect using, again, the Telegraph and uh, Morse code. And um, some most economists, uh, such as the Keynes and the book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, uh, start discussing about the links between technology and uh, finance. Um, <clears throat> moving forward, we have uh, the, the next years, uh, we have the introduction of the credit cards and then the ATMs and uh, the electronic, uh, uh, um, the, the stock uh, uh, trading start um, uh, being uh, uh, relevant. Um, then, Moving forward in 1980s, uh, again, uh, there has been this was the the the, <clears throat> the decade where it, it, um, this the stage for the later internet and e-commerce business model was uh, set. Uh, we have the first online brokerage, um, e-trade, online banking started in UK. And of course, we had the introduction of, of, the, of the, the web um, this um, decade. Um, moving forward, the financial technology as a, as a term um, happened in 1993. And then in, this, uh, in these years, we, internet banking uh, becomes very popular among uh, the U.S. banks, and we have the, also the introduction of uh, some um, firms that use technology uh, for finance, such as uh, PayPal, to actually arrive to today, where um, from 2009, fintech has started to become more and more relevant uh, in financial services. We have the introduction of Bitcoin 2009, then uh, several um, developments such as, such as uh, Apple Pay, Smile to Pay in China, um, Google, and of course the introduction of neobanks in the recent years. Um, but when we talk about fintech, uh, there are different definitions and in the paper we just um, use them on the most uh, uh, common one. Um, so fintech in a sense they is a technological innovations that have the, this uh, this uh, power to 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 change the provision of financial services the financial markets and institutions and uh, they drive actually um, the development the creation of novel business models applications processes and products um but um, in contrast to previous uh, technological developments, uh, fintech is not an evolution, it's just a revolution. It has a significant impact on the entire financial system uh, and, of course, the economy. And it, it draws power and leverages these uh, technological elements such as DLTs, um, cloud computing, big data, it, it offers solutions that um, have the ability to, to address these current gap, gaps in the provision of financial services. Of course, uh, this uh, has an impact in this uh, uh, flow of funds uh, framework and how the funds are transferred between the economic um, agents. Now, uh, I will try to, to give you uh, a brief idea now uh, how the how fintech has uh, has this power to to transform the the financial services, and uh, 
we, we, we can think about it as, um, um, as users. And if we, if we try to group our, our needs, um, this will be the payments, uh, the savings, borrowing, managing risks, and getting advice about our investments. Then um, trying to, um, to satisfy those needs, uh, at the moment there are several gaps about the speed, cost, transparency, access, and security. And there, there are these traditional models that um, they try to satisfy those needs. Then we have some technological innovations, the recent years, the IEs, the uh, machine learning, cloud computing, uh, big data, uh, DLTs, cryptography, and mobile developments, uh, which actually fintech leverages to provide uh, solutions um, for, for those uh, needs. So if we start with, uh, with payments, uh, Traditionally, we have the cash, the ATMs, uh, debit, debit and credit cards. Then FinTech uh, comes to actually uh, cover uh, these needs better, offering uh, the mobile payments, the P2P payments, uh, DLT-based uh, settlement. And um, here, in a sense, um, what this uh, graph shows is that uh, FinTech uh, leverages more uh, technologies uh, like uh, uh, for providing these services like uh, uh, data, com uh, cloud computing, DLT, cryptography, and mobile applications, less the IEs for, for the particular uh, space. Then for, for savings, uh, we have the, the traditionally the bank deposits, uh, the mutual funds, bonds, equities. Um, again, FinTech um, leveraging the data, uh, the cloud computing, DLT and cryptography provides digital currencies, uh, mobile market funds, blo blockchain uh, bonds are some of the solutions uh, in the particular uh, space. Now for the borrowing, uh, we have the, our normal mortgages, uh, bank loans and so on. Um, but here FinTech, um, based on a variety of innovations, provides the crowdfunding, again, blockchain bonds, platform lending, which we will we'll, uh, discuss further later. Um, same for, for the managing risks. We have the uh, traditionally uh, brokerage underwriting and uh, so on, uh, insurance, uh, but then, FinTech comes with direct tech, subtech, smart contracts, uh, crypto asset exchanges, digital IDs um, to cover the, the needs for the particular space. And uh, traditionally, when it comes to getting advice about our investments, we will have our financial planner, investment advisor, we'll go there, talk to, to them, uh, they give us advice. Now, FinTech can do that with the use, using artificial intelligence, ro robo-advising, automatic wealth management, and so on. Um, if we want to, to give just a brief um, um, outlook of uh, the FinTech industry, we can say that uh, all over the world, um, countries uh, start um, being interested in fintech and start uh, um, investing in it but um, the adoption is quite different and the the main reasons for that are consumer needs financial and technological infrastructure level of development regulatory framework and the available capital for the required uh, investment um, in general um, the revenue of um, the fintech companies it's only um, a small part of the revenue of the financial services industry. However, um, these uh, companies um, grow fast and they contribute clearly, significantly to innovation. Um, US has uh, the majority of the patents, uh, especially 
related to payment services. And um, those uh, firms actually that uh, engage in crowdfunding and payment services receive approximately 25% of the venture and startup funding in the industry, whereas 20% of the new IPOs are for firms that belong in the financial sector, um, where about actually uh, fintech companies and the majority of them take place in the US. Now, although in the paper we cover um, in more detail uh, almost every region in the world, here I just uh, chose um, four of them. And uh, I will start with the Sub-Saharan Africa. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, FinTech has been the engine of growth and economic development. And um, uh, transforming and re reforming the entire financial services value chain. And mobile money has been the, the main driver of, of, uh, of, this, uh, of the change of, in the provision of financial services in the region, uh, making those countries uh, actually leaders in the particular um, uh, fintech uh, solution uh, in terms of innovation, um, adoption per, per uh, capita, and um, usage. Uh, of course, um, because of the success of the mobile um, money, there is also growing demand uh, for other uh, services in the region, uh, such as digital credit, um, savings, uh, insurance, investment. And with uh, um, the fintech uh, mobile money uh, providers uh, try to satisfy, uh, taking advantage, of course, of their success of the success of their platforms in the mobile money um, industry. Uh, however, in, in the area, uh, there is a noteworthy, although decreasing over time, heterogeneity in the adoption and usage, in, in usage of uh, mobile money. And this is mainly driven by uh, the initial differences in the regulation, the pricing, and the network re reliability. And we have the, the East Africa countries being the leaders in terms of the um, adoption and, and usage of uh, mobile money and where the, the majority of the fintech uh, capital uh, goes. However, if we want to, to give a title about the impact of fintech in, in the region, there is an improvement in the availability and affordability of financial services. There is still a long way to go but this is a good starting point uh, for the region. Uh, and we have an increase in financial inclu inclusion and a reduction in, in poverty. Um, one of the, of the reasons that mobile money has been so successful in, in, um, in this region is the lack of sufficient financial market infrastructure. So you don't have uh, so many branches or ATMs and um, also, the, uh, the efficient market strategies and pricing of um, the providers of the mobile money uh, platforms, uh, as well as the, the cooperation between them and um, the um, respective authorities, central banks, uh, have helped um, towards the success of this uh, mobile money. A good example is uh, the Safaricom and, uh, of course, uh, the M-Pesa, uh, which is a, a very known uh, and well-researched um, case in, in the region. Now, moving forward um, to another uh, region, um, and that, that of Asia. And here we have actually um, progress in almost every aspect of the of the digitalization and fintech. Um, of course, there is a, a, a big difference between the, the adoption of these the technologies across the countries of, of, this, um, of this region. But um, <clears throat> China is the um, global leader in fintech, um, taking advantage of the, the, the enormous market, the light approach to regulation at the initial stages, and then 
Um, of course, uh, the the fact that in the region they they operate some very uh, successful big tech uh, companies. Um, same is um, the the picture for India, and in India we have also tech um, companies have some have uh, success because again of the uh, of of the, the regulation. Um, they mainly operate in ur urban centers, uh, but the, most of the times they they work there complementary to uh, the traditional financial uh, services providers. Then, if we look uh, to the ASEAN um, countries, um, fintech there is at initial stages, but is growing fast, and the main play in the market, there are the banks and money issuers, which, who, which includes also the uh, non-banking financial uh, institutions. And in Singapore, Indonesia, in Thailand, uh, the, the fintech applications are across the, the financial services um, value chain. Another important uh, characteristic of the region is that <clears throat> Asia leads in crypto assets and um, initial coin, coin offerings. And uh, as an example, I would give um, before before the uh, before um, the regulation in China becomes stricter, um, ninety percent of the trading volume of Bitcoin uh, was against the the, the ramen beat. Now, <clears throat> of course, um, fintech usage differs across income groups, sex. And living location. This is also a characteristic that you can find in the uh, sub Saharan African uh, countries as well. Um, and uh, here, as an example, for in, in India, mobile transactions between the, the rich in the uh, for each, uh, richest groups are four times more than the poorest. In Bangladesh, the my mobile money account ownership is three to one between men and women. Um, however, when we look at the mobile banking, um, the Asia re region is behind uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the main reason here is that uh, the traditional infrastructure in A Asia uh, was uh, more developed. So the the need for a, an alternative uh, was not that um, that uh, that uh, uh, big. Now um, going forward uh, in another region, uh, Europe, and Europe is a region that uh, has uh, proactively embraced fintech innovations in recent years, and we have actually uh, a lot of of, of uh, different. Fintech companies operating across the financial value uh, services value chain. Uh, Transferwise, uh, Revolut, Monzo, N26, I think, is some of, of the examples of those big companies, which uh, are also unicorns. Um, there are several reasons for for the this uh, success of fintech in the this uh, ad adoption of fintech in the region, the existing um, IT infrastructure, the available talent, accessible funding, government backing, the regulatory framework, and a, a fintech uh, friendly ecosystem. And if we want to, to translate this into numbers, between 2018 and 2019, there was 70% increase in total investment in fintech companies in the region, a 40% increase in related deals, and 73% um, venture capital investment for fintech companies in that uh, region. Now, UK is the leading in uh, is leading innovation and investment in the region. France and Netherlands uh, follow closely. Um, now Switzerland um, has, has a target to, to, to be the, the hub for cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And then looking at Germany, 39% uh, increase in total investments for FinTech in 2019. Uh, if we go to the 
uh, the, the Baltic uh, region. Uh, Estonia, for example, tries to become a fintech hub, attracts an increasing number of fintech and startups. Um, Bulgaria in the Balkan region, um, offering a, a low cost environment, tries also to become a fintech hub. Um, however, although the, the fintech adoption is quite high, it's not the same across these countries uh, of, 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 of this region. And for example, um, gas is still prevalent uh, in some countries for payments of pensions, <clears throat> wages and bills. Um, more than 90, more than 65% uh, of people in uh, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania still pay their bills in cash. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, one is the, the, the lack of faith in the financial institutions in, in these uh, countries, high costs of the uh, fintech applications, a sophisticated customization, um, and the lack of competition in the payment space. Um, just uh, as an example, in some countries, um, banks are all, the only ones allowed to offer uh, financial services. Another important uh, um, driver for these differences is that in many countries, there is a lack of uh, a national uh, fintech uh, strategy. Finally, uh, when we look at the, the Americas region, US dominates the fintech market, um, Canada and Latin America follow, uh, YSA dominate 93% of the fintech investments in 2019 uh, were attracted uh, by the US um, market. However, generally there is, there is an increase in the fintech ecosystems across, across the, uh, the region. Um, a particular characteristic is that there are more money per venture capital deal than number of actual deals. Uh, this is uh, um, this is uh, uh, more obvious in the U.S. market, and the reason is that the, this market is quite mature. So the, the main players, uh, fintech players in the market, can actually uh, demand more money uh, from the investors that want to invest uh, in, in their um, companies. Now, when we look which type of uh, fintech investment, uh, are more popular payment services attract most investments, and there is a trend for the prevention of, of fraud and anti money laundering uh, applications. Now, um, in terms of the US, US is uh, top three fintech markets in the world. The market, however, is mandate highly competitive. And there is the, the trend of hybridization where the fintech companies um, are not specializing only in one uh, fintech, um, in one sorry, space like payments, but they offer payments, uh, so payment solutions, saving solutions, and so on, all in, in the same um, company. Then the, in Canada has proactively monitor fintech developments and the fintech market in the country. Uh, grows. Uh, Bank of Canada has uh, done a lot of research to investigate whether uh, what it will be the impact of uh, fintech in the financial system. However, uh, what is uh, interesting is both US and Canada have very low uh, fintech adoption compared to other uh, countries in the world, 46% uh, and 50% uh, respectively. And um, the, the one of the some of the reasons is that in these areas, in these countries, we have a big financial institutions operating, a traditional financial institutions, very strong, very uh, um, resilient ones, and uh, there is also this faith of people to those uh, financial institutions. And then um, the, um, the the slow response of regulators to to revise. Um, the uh, the policies for for fintech is also a, another reason why this low adoption. Finally, when it comes to uh, to Latin America, uh, there is this uh, growth in terms of fintech. Uh, Eighty five percent 
um, of um, sorry, 58% of the startups um, are focusing on payments, alternative finance, and corporate financial management spaces. And here, Brazil uh, accounts for one third of the number of fintech startups in the region. Mexico and Colombia uh, follow. Now, um, I, I, we, we, I try to, to do here is uh, I, I try to summarize the, the findings um, of the empirical uh, research and other surveys uh, and reports in, in terms of, of the opportunities and risks and try to put them under um, a title for, for the economic agents. And I start with, uh, with uh, household. Uh, one of the, 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 the main benefits for, uh, for, the, uh, for households uh, that uh, FinTech offers is financial inclusion and reduction of poverty. This is very uh, particularly um, obvious um, in developing countries uh, where, where there was a lack of uh, the traditional financial infrastructure and uh, very few people actually had this to, to the to very simple banking services. Now FinTech offers this, um, this opportunity. And then we have a mitigation of discrimination and promotion of uh, equality. Um, for example, in China and the Taobao vendors that would, no one would lend them because they have very low credit history. Uh, then Taobao, um, offer them this um, uh, chance and so the, the, the platform, fintech platforms, and um, this is um, an example of this uh, benefit. Now, if we look uh, closely to a particular uh, fintech applications um, and mobile money, they facilitate transactions for longer distances where uh, or where cash has higher opportunity costs. You can think of areas where there is a high crime rate or during rough periods or um, unexpected shocks. And the findings of several empirical research, particularly in Africa, has shown that the FinTech has really contributed, um, <laughs> has really helped uh, households to cope with all the, those uh, difficulties. And then when we look at cryptocurrencies, uh, by default, uh, they have this characteristic discretion, the autonomy, removal of fees when you, you do international transactions, and effective diversification when you use them um, in, in a portfolio investments. And uh, this is uh, uh, an area where a lot of papers um, have a focus uh, how Bitcoin can be used as uh, a hedging instrument. Um, then, when we look at the the, the lending space, uh, the efficiency of financial and the mediation, easiness, better pricing, and cost reductions. Um, there is uh, some findings. That there are some findings talking about uh, uh, the the mortgage applications uh, are um, handled 20% faster that, compared to, to to banks, for for example. And then we have better wealth management and investment decisions with robot advisors, particularly for those investors that were uh, um, their portfolios were not very um, diversified. And finally, the reduction of insurance costs. Um, FinTech uh, offers the for some FinTech applications uh, offer the the chance of different households to call to um, in, to to actually share the cost of. Uh, the same insurance contract. However, when we, when we, it's not only about the benefits, but also about the risks. And uh, uh, you, you need to keep in mind that uh, uh, FinTech has the power to transform the financial services into a data-driven environment. And uh, of data for, for FinTech companies is the, the holy grail, if you want. Um, it is the, um, not only a competitive advantage, but also a measure of success in doing business. And of course, you can understand that data is very important because uh, it will allow the companies to, to, to offer better customer experience, offer um, a better uh, customization, uh, better pricing on average. Um, but at the same time, gathering data um, 
in, the, in, in all in one place, um, you leave uh, a lot of uh, risks. And um, risks were always, um, data breaches were always there for the financial system. What happens now is uh, because of the digitization and the interconnectivity that is driven by fintech, it allows uh, much more access points to, to hackers if they want to, uh, to, to do damage. So cybersecurity risk, hacking and data breaches, uh, this can lead to identity theft and personal data exploitation for illegal activities and unauthorized financial transactions. Um, if your bank especially uh, doesn't cover for that, you can imagine how, uh, how harmful it can be for, for an investor for a, for a household, uh, then we, you have fraudulent activities and predatory practices because of the increased intermediation, complexity, and confusion. Uh, some fintech pro products are very complex. It's easy to uh, some people to, to get confused, and some uh, people try to, to take advantage of that. Um, a good example um, is. Uh, the, the, the period between 2011 and 2015 in China and the P2P uh, lending platforms there, a lot of frauds going on and there was not much regulation. Uh, a lot of people lost uh, their, their uh, money there. Then financial exclusion, cherry picking practices, gender inequality, gender inequality or geographical preference. Um, the research uh, mainly here focuses on uh, in this one in the lending space um, and uh, financial exclusion. Just to give an example, imagine that uh, the decision whether you get a loan or not is based on the fact uh, uh, not what you are doing, but what uh, a group that with which you share certain characteristics is doing. For example, if uh, um, you you buy. I will give just a, a very extreme example. If you buy biscuits every uh, Christmas, and uh, it, the research uh, has found a correlation between buying biscuits and uh, being unable to fulfill your mortgage obligations, then there is highly likely that you are rejected by the um, by the algorithm. And because um, this is a, a huge discussion whether the algorithms are based on. Uh, uh, correlations rather than causality. And uh, price discrimination, again, uh, with the same concept, of course, someone can say, okay, price discrimination, but, uh, um, but this, is, uh, um, this is fine, because if someone is uh, riskier, why they should pay the same uh, rate as someone that is less uh, riskier? Um, but then again, um, this opens a discussion about how these algorithms and uh, platforms decide on who to, um, uh, what price to give. And then about the cryptocurrencies, a lot of uh, money comes there, scam wallets, fraudulent exchanges. Um, many exchanges have been closed already. There was in 2014 the MT Gox. Uh, where it collapsed because uh, they they managed to uh, to steal like uh, 450 million, I think, uh, worth of uh, dollars worth of uh, cryptocurrency from this uh, exchange. And then, of course, not all solutions are suitable for everyone. Now, moving to for, to, to to firms, and again, for firms, especially the small businesses, there is this improvement and acceleration of financial inclusion. This is not a characteristic only for the development countries, but also the developed countries where small businesses have really a difficulty in getting the necessary funding because they don't fulfill the, the sometimes very strict requirements for the banks to lend them or venture capitalists to invest in those. And then we have, of course, promotion of equality, social cohesion, elimination of uh, gender discrimination. These are kind of uh, characteristics, benefits that are shared uh, with the households and uh, what uh, the relevant research uh, has uh, found. Of course, we have uh, on top of that a reduction of credit and systematic risk efficiency, reduction of cost and speed in lending space, um, the fintech applications, the, the platforms, lending platforms, the way they operate, um, the fact that they have big data, uh, they can make decisions fast. Uh, they can offer sometimes better uh, prices. 
um, and um, the, the, a reduction of uh, costs. In addition, when you look um, in the uh, in terms of, of the lending space, um, imagine that uh, using a crowdfunding funding, for example, you can pull funds from different sources, so then this is um, better. And uh, um, when we look to crowdfunding specifically, uh, there are additional benefits depending on the type of crowdfunding. Uh, for example, when you look at the reward crowdfund crowdfunding, you can think of a supply chain financing, um, a, a, a pre-purchase of the product so where you fund um, the, the product before you, it is even there. And then you have the donation crowdfunding, uh, more like a bootstrap financing and equity crowdfunding, which can easily substitute the venture capital. Uh, then um, in terms of financing, we have alternative options when it comes to fintech, and this is the ICOS, um, so the initial coin offers. And uh, Although the research here is uh, still young, there are not many papers, but uh, recent papers, what they talk about is that if ICOs done properly, designed properly, executed properly, to have more security, liquidity, and transparency compared with IPOs. And then when it comes to cryptocurrencies, transaction fees reduction and protection against uh, chargeback frauds, um, there, there is this irreversibility of transactions when it comes to Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies, and general improvements in corporate governance and other financial tax and operations. You can think of uh, the smart contracts. Now, when it comes to risks, the the firms share similar risks with uh, uh, with um, households, but uh, on a greater scale, you can think of the cybersecurity and, of course, the financing. Um, are two particular areas uh, where uh, most of the research focuses. Um, and uh, the reason is when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, imagine that a, a data breach uh, for a company compared to a household can be, have a greater damage, uh, not only to the company, but uh, maybe to the financial system as well. Um, that is the reason a lot of companies invest a lot uh, in, in terms of cyber, cyber uh, security. However, this is always a big discussion about the balance between the, the, the benefit of uh, investing a lot in cybersecurity and uh, the costs of, that this can have and whether the, at the end you will save a lot of money compared to not having um, invested cybersecurity. And that is why in recent years there is this trend for the cybersecurity insurance. Um, now, when it comes to crowdfunding, uh, it is not optimal for every firm. And uh, there is always a probability to fail to raise the necessary funds, and also um, a probability of intellectual property theft. Uh, you can think of the reward card to present for your product before it is even uh, ready. So there's always the chance someone else steals your idea, is uh, more efficient, faster, and they can actually. Uh, make it before you introduce it to the market. And then uh, general crowdfunding is uh, suitable for experienced fundraisers. And the, most of the, uh, some of the backers, uh, when it comes to the crowdfunding, they have this spray and pray strategy. So if you are a company that you want a follow-up uh, funding, uh, this is not a, a, a good uh, way to do so. And of course the ICOs, it's much more expensive at the moment than the than an equity security in IPO. Uh, just an example, in 2017, an ICO would cost uh, 1 million to 3 million, whereas uh, to, to register a security, um, a traditional exchange rate will cost between uh, 125,000 to $300,000. Uh, now, uh, in this paper, what we try to do is just um, all the banks are, are firms in a sense, but because they have a particular uh, role in the financial system, um, they do share some of the opportunities and risks that other uh, that, uh, firms uh, share, but um, they have uh, some uh, differences. Um, if we look at the banks as intermediaries and we look through the um, 
the perspective of their functions. So the three that remain functions, the transformation of assets, maturity transformation, the provision of liquidity, and the collection and processing of um, information. So if we want to look uh, at, at, this, uh, um, at these functions and how um, FinTech can help uh, improve uh, or benefit these functions, uh, when it comes to asset transformation, maturity transformation, we have uh, FinTech can help banks to, to gather the necessary uh, funding resources uh, so they can have the resources to do this uh, transformation. Uh, the reduce the compliance costs, improve the precision of risk assessment when they do the maturity transformation. And then you have uh, technologies in areas of enhanced identity verification, investment profile, consumer behavior, which uh, might really help the bank uh, do this uh, function better. And when it comes to the provision of liquidity, uh, FinTech can all offer speed and efficiency of packing services, flexibility, uh, so they can customize their products faster and better. Um, they, research has shown that it can help them increase also the market share, um, better customer experience and pricing of products and services. And of course, they can offer them this access to areas with no unlimited financial infrastructure um, that they couldn't uh, access before. And when it comes to the collection and processing of information, uh, we have an in, increase in the speed of collection and process, the processing of hard, info, hard information, improvement of efficiency, speed, and profitability across the chain of liquidity provision. Um, this can also help uh, increase the bank's competitiveness in risk management and advisory services um, because of, of this um, better collection of this information. And because we all know that uh, Several banks, at least the pattern some years ago was this uh, soft information. Um, now that this is potential, they offer the fintech offers this potential uh, to do the partial hardening of the soft information, so it will be better uh, managed. Now, if we want to to look at the, the risks for the banks and challenges, there is an increased competition in the provision of liquidity. This is the main area where fintech actually uh, can compete uh, very well with, with the banks. And uh, this is because there, there are strict regulations and requirements for banks, but there is no, there's no really particular regulations for, for no bank fintech companies. Some of them, they also uh, explore the regu regulatory, arbitra regulatory arbitrage opportunities. And of course, fintech companies have lower costs to proprietary technologies and economies uh, they can take advantage of economies of scope and scale. Again, another challenge is the, this is the mediation of uh, the existing banks and the fact that um, these uh, fintech companies uh, can uh, offer um, solutions that accommodate payments and transactions without the need of the intermediary. And then um, a major risk uh, is the, the loss of market share, a reduction of bank deposits. This is uh, something that uh, many papers have uh, particularly highlighted. Um, and this is, uh, although this is, comes mainly from those fintech, fintech companies um, that, um, it, that operate in areas where um, there is uh, no um, traditional financial infrastructure. And then you have also um, at the end, uh, for example, in the, of 2017, approximately 30% 30, 30 of mortgage loans in the US originated from fintech firms. And finally, the new banks. Now, the new banks uh, it, it is a new type of firms offer cutting edge it's a technology, fully digital banking services uh, that are more accessible than um, those offered by traditional banks. They come with, with or without banking license or partially restricting banking license. Uh, of course, the, the, competitor, the main competitors are those with a, a, a banking license to the banks. Now, in terms of the governments, uh, what is a, 
what is very important here um, in terms of the opportunities um, and the implementation of research applications for, for governments, uh, there are three spaces, the payments, um, then you have the taxation, and of course, uh, the financing, uh, the, um, the uh, issuance of bonds and other similar type of securities. They can offer reduction of bureaucracy, crime and corruption, uh, costs and time uh, in the provision of financial um, services, so, um, and then increase of efficiency, transparency, speed and accessibility. Um, they, they, they can offer an edge to the governments uh, when you have um, difficult times, such as the time now we're facing now, COVID-19, can offer also facilitation, the tax collection and reduction of uh, slippage. And in terms of the issuance of bonds, a good example is Amakiba in Kenya, uh, the electronic issuance uh, through a mobile phone of a bond, uh, efficient administration of, of, of grants, Ethereum blockchain in Canada, an example, decision for bids or public contracts, uh, the, uh, like the uh, HACMX in Mexico. And when it comes to, to, to the risks and uh, challenges, um, it is very hard for some governments to implement fintech. Uh, and uh, because they lack the infrastructure, the public uh, servants don't have the necessary skills sometimes, and the, the, the capital required is might be massive. There are also cyber security issues, data protection and management issues, uh, system compatibilities. Um, and there is also these uh, uh, challenges that are related to general culture. Some uh, countries, they don't like technology, they will never use it, no matter how they can change their, uh, their lives. And of course, money laundering and illegal activities is another uh, problem for uh, that governments have to face when it comes to, um, to fintech. For, 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 the, uh, for the central banks, um, we treat it as a part of the government, although they might be autonomous, uh, but, but again, um, FinTech can help central banks to gather better information, uh, super, uh, do the supervision and risk management, mon mon monetary policy scrutiny in, in a better way. Uh, there are some bots uh, even used uh, nowadays, I think Bank of England use a bot uh, for several, but they can even improve it to become better uh, with artificial intelligence. Machine learning covariate in different scenarios and policy analyses, um, and that can lead to an improvement in monitoring transactions and overseeing the financial system, and then improvement in financial stability through diversification and decentralization of some uh, services um, are some of the things that uh, some of the benefits that fintech can offer. Um, then we have the deficiency in operations, transparency, and ease of, uh, of access to uh, financial services. Now, in terms of the risks, of course, again, cybersecurity risks. Um, if the uh, virtual currencies becomes the norm, we might have an alteration of money demand that will have issues to um, the inflation management. Uh, some papers have talked about that. Um, and there is um, this, there will be a change also in the structure of the balance sheet should digital currency becomes widespread. Um, this is a promising area of research um, uh, about the, the um, central bank digital currencies. Um, I will not go too much into detail, uh, but in the paper, I, I will discuss this further. Uh, I think this, this can be um, a the future anyway, and uh, it's good for, for further research. There are not many papers, but the central banks are really interested in that, that, um, in that area. And then overseeing fintech applications may, may provide a difficult task because of their complexity. And of course, uh, findings uh, suggest that 46% of Bitcoin transactions and 25% of Bitcoin users are involved in legal activity which uh, is also something, uh, a challenge that central banks um, have to face. Now, we'll try to, to be as uh, um, uh, 
I will try to summarize this as fast as possible. So when it comes to regulation and government governance of fintech, um, it is an important part of the, the, of the, the, the fintech uh, um, revolution. And uh, governance is essential not only to, to, to just find the balance between the, um, the benefits and the risks of fintech. Um, now, however, this is not an, an easy task. It's very difficult. Uh, I'm not sure this will be possible anytime soon because of the different interests that different countries around the world have uh, when it comes to fintech. The challenges in terms of regulation um, that uh, the regulators anyway face um, comes from the macroeconomic domain effect on financial integrity and stability that fintech companies can have. The easier diffusion of adverse shocks and the high degree of information asymmetry in the fintech industry, and the, the, regula the regulatory ambiguity and the disintermediated value chains make the life of regulators very, very difficult. Uh, and also, the speed that uh, things change uh, might exceed the capacity of, of those regulators. So, if we try to, to see the fintech industry um, as these three, the fintech three, uh, and uh, we can see here we have the policy enables, enablers, the enabling technologies and the fintech activities. For all these parts of the tree, the, 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 the regulators have tried to do uh, actually nothing. So regulatory status unchanged, they didn't change any regulation, or they tried to introduce fintech specific regulation for each one of the parts of this tree, or just to ban specific uh, parts of the tree. Now, we can see, uh, in terms of the, the re, we can group the regulatory approaches overall as wait and see, which is an approach that uh, some governments have tried in terms of fintech, Observation and mo monitoring of fintech by regulators. Fintech players can innovate freely. Uh, this is very useful in the initial stages when there is uh, some re regulatory opacity and more information is necessary. This is not a passive approach, but is characterized by active learning. Another category of approaches is test and learn. And when it comes to test and learn, we, this, is, uh, we, this approach is characterized by the agility in the implementation of the existing regulation on a case-by-case -case basis, but also active uh, monitoring. Um, you can think of test and learn as a, regula a regulatory sandbox, but the sandbox is the open market, is the entire market. Um, there is some variation across jurisdictions, simply because there are different regulations for fintech across jurisdictions. But this approach requires experienced regulators and it's very hard to implement in very large fintech markets. Now, developed countries, most of the times, follow this approach, innovation facilitators, the regulators drive the initiatives instead of being simple observers. This is a top bottom approach. And it can take three forms, innovation hubs, re regulatory sandboxes, regulator accelerators. They can implement all or one of them. Um, and uh, this is, has been um, the case um, in recent years in, as I mentioned, developed countries. And then after you do all the, or, or you implement all those, one of, or more of the previous approaches, there is this transformation of regulation and reform. And is used when the implementation of existing policies to fintech is impossible. So you, you have new laws that aim at extending the, re, the regulatory parameters, precise requirements for, for new entrants or funds um, under this category. And what happens is common law jurisdictions in general apply existing regulation or modify the existing processes. Civil law jurisdictions either modify procedures if there is a single regulator or develop uh, new 
legisla legislation. Um, now, again, uh, th there is um, some popular part of the, um, of in, in terms of regulation, uh, stream of research, talking about uh, trying to find the reasons why there is not uh, a, a considerable regulatory response. One of the reasons they mention is because fintech at the moment doesn't have a massive impact on fin financial system, so there is no need for changing considerably the regulation to account for uh, for this um, for for this impact. Now, if we want to summarize um, very briefly all the uh, the previous uh, slides, uh, fintech gradually gains pace almost everywhere in the world. We have different level of adoption and penetration in different uh, in different regions. Uh, and it creates opportunities, but also entails risks for all the economic agents. Um, the effective governance, regulation, and supervision will indeed play an important role um, in enabling in um, enabling the fintech, but also protect the financial system and economy, particularly the most vulnerable uh, groups of, of the um, economy. Uh, big tech companies will continue playing an important role in the fintech industry, but their actual impact on the financial system is yet to be determined. We don't know much about them. And uh, research is still nascent with respect to fintech applications, their own an impact on the financial system. Now, some good ideas for future research uh, can be, for example, the, the extent to which fintech can help alleviate the issues caused by disastrous e events, such as a global pandemic. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of papers coming out uh, in the following months based, uh, talking about that. Then the potential of fintech to change the way the financing of companies takes place and how this differs in developed and developing countries is another important area. Uh, corporate finance will change uh, as we know it because of fintech. But this is how I, I see it. Central bank digital currencies, as I mentioned, this is uh, for me is uh, one of the most promising areas. And then we have the development of new methodologies that could provide an angle on how to understand the impact of fintech in producing positive changes. Um, and then, of course, one of the biggest issues at the moment when it comes to fintech is how we should measure fintech, how, 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 how we measure fintech, and how we collect the related data. What is the related data? This is an, an, a, a big problem for researchers. And then um, we have the impact of fintech on profitability performance of the comp of a company industry, uh, price discovery, speed of settlements in trading, information asymmetries. And finally, is this the technology that drives finance uh, and those changes, or is the or is the other way around? So this again something that can be interesting. Investigating. So, uh, with that, I, I have finished. Thank you for for uh, listening to me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and uh, I am uh, open to any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, thanks to provide this very interesting and very comprehensive about the fintechs. I think uh, I learned a lot from here, and also very informative. Um, so um, now I think uh, it's time to open any uh, discussion or any questions uh, related to um, your, your your talk. So um, so you, if you want to ask the questions, you can put your your your, your questions in the you know, a chat box, or you can raise your hand. I will be uh, you know we can we can um, we can start to have our Q and A session. Okay, maybe, maybe I can start the, uh, first. So I have a few questions I want to ask. Okay, I already put in the, uh, the the chat box. I think the first question is, what are the reasons for this geo uh, geographic difference in terms of their growth? 
in the, in the beginning, you talk about this growth of the fintech in the different regions. So I, the, the, the questions I want to ask, what's the reason behind this difference? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, 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 I cover it uh, later, I think, through the presentation. Um, different reasons, um, the, 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 infrastructure, the existing infrastructure, the government planning, um, the um, ability uh, of, of um, the, 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 the talent available. Um, then you have uh, how much um, um, the government is inclined to spend. And you can, you, you can um, if, you, if you want to group um, the regions, uh, the main difference between developed and developed countries is that in some developing countries there is really there was really a need of an alternative way to for the provision of financial services and it was like there, there was no other option so that's why they are fintech especially if you think about the sub-saharan african countries there is a lot of investment going on there um of course the providers don't do that they do that to, 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 to earn money, but at the same time, this helps um, all the households and firms in the region. In the developed countries, uh, there, there are different um, drivers. Um, we're in the different level. Here we have also the luxury to think about uh, data protection much more and uh, other related issues. But generally, when it comes to to the, the geographic differences, you can think of um, government spending, existing infrastructure, uh, and available uh, talent can be uh, some of the drivers uh, in the operation of uh, big tech uh, companies. And of course, the regulatory framework. These are uh, the main drivers for this. Okay. Is, um, it, is, it, is it possible? Um, what, what I'm thinking, is it possible they, they are uh, financial no, development is different. So in the different thing uh, between the de developed country and the developing country. So uh, if your financial uh, development is poor, is it po possible for fintech to have a more space to grow? Thing like uh, in African countries. Yes, yes. As I mentioned, the financial infrastructure, for example, uh, it, it, this is this one was well, the main difference between developing and developed developed countries. At least what the research uh, the, the research has shown in terms of the findings is like um, because the, the 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 lack of the financial infrastructure in those countries, um, th there was this space there for fintech uh, applications, mobile money applications to sign. We didn't have that, that particular issue here in UK, for example, or in other developed countries. But there was really a necessity. There was no other alternative. So I think, yes, for sure, that's why you can see also the fintech adoption and penetration is much higher in the developing countries than developed countries. Okay, so I think I will leave my questions at the end. And now uh, maybe uh, Peter, do you have any questions to ask? I, I saw you raise your hand. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the presenter. I think it was a well researched paper, but nevertheless, I will be very honest with you. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, research from a practical standpoint that needs to go into it. I have quite a few questions uh, for the presenter. Uh, in terms of the regulations, we don't have regulations for uh, fintech, uh, and and of course uh, the fintech it's uh, the way forward uh, for the whole world to run on a new model. Then there's a question of you know the financial inclusion. Financial inclusion, we are promoting this across the world. So uh, I mean, uh, on the last intervention. Uh, there is a disparity between developed and developing uh, world. What happened to the de developing world? You know, do we have the fintech uh, innovations. Uh, we we also ran on the internet, and of course, to be very practical, I had the internet problem. Quite a few minutes to join with your uh, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, there are quite a few areas that needs to uh, be taught through and go into the deep research because we cannot uh, launch a paper 
which uh, certainly is just uh, uh, presenting uh, the, the digital part. We need to look at the practical side, because it's a practical side that really interests uh, the customers, the firms, and everything. For example, I will use a, a typical example. What are providing security for fintech? How do you provide syndicated facilities? How do you provide? Uh, likewise, um, you could uh, certainly, if you wanted to discount it, how do you discount? There's an element of uh, fraud. So, I mean, there's quite a lot of things that needs to go in, into this uh, research. I'm sorry, but I'm being very blunt, but it's not a question of criticizing the presenter, but just to be very frank, so at least you are becoming aware of uh, all the uh, weaknesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah I, I can. Uh, th th thank yeah. you for uh, for 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 this uh, comment. Uh, it's uh, really important. Uh, basically, that's why we, we present the paper, isn't it? So we we, we just uh, uh, hear opinion, the opinion of some people that are very experienced and. Uh, um, you you are right. I'm I'm not sure. Um, I I I'm not sure. I I I understand. I I think what you mentioned is about the practical implementation in terms of of, uh, of fintech. But I haven't mentioned um, many things. Um, I will take this into account when I'm I'm, I'm revising the paper. It just. Uh, um, in terms of the presentation, I had to leave out many, uh, many parts. Uh, so um, I will check again. Um, I'm sure somewhere in the paper we, we cover this aspect, but uh, it, it's good to hear that this is something that we need to, to promote more for the paper to be uh, better. Thanks. You know, I mean, uh, certainly I appreciate that uh, you know, we can't uh, certainly load the paper with all sorts of practicalities, but nevertheless, uh, um, uh, FinTech uh, becomes into existence to facilitate the uh, the living of uh, people, to facilitate transactions. We don't want to, uh, you know, there are so many people who are illiterate, but they've got bank accounts. How do you certainly promote? There has to be capacity building. You know, but my mainly worry for the developing world, fine, you could teach uh, people, uh, do some kind of um, clinics with them for the developing world. And uh, you can think about the farmer. How do you explain to them about the fintech? What's this animal fintech? And uh, of course, they are used to this. And of course, um, you know, over a long period of time, they will get used to it. You have to start somewhere. I agree with it. I don't uh, dispute it. But, for, uh, you know, a farmer is sending a, a bunch of uh, fruits and vegetables. How do you say I pay you with uh, fintech, uh, bitcoins? What's this animal, you know? I, I'm sorry, these are the practical things of life. They say, my friend, I need the cash because then the cash has got a re regulatory system. They want to see the solid cash. Over time, it will change. We are in a modern world. We are uh, resetting the whole economic uh, order, but we have to think ahead. We can't think uh, just now for tomorrow. It cannot happen. And mind you, there's the Basel uh, Agreement. How do you integrate FinTech into that? All these are... Uh, uh, sort of uh, provocative questions which are being asked. And uh, mind you, you also mentioned about the collecting of data. Do we have capacity to collect data? So many banks, you know, you just ask them for a simple statement. They say, I'm sorry, I have to send it to my head office. You don't get it on time. And I appreciate there's a real-time banking uh, system online, but it's not perfect. We're still having problems, you know? So all this has got to think, uh, we have to think about it in a very practical way. Uh, we have to use a roadmap which uh, shows what are the weaknesses, fine tune the weaknesses so that when it comes, it will not be a perfect uh, system. We will have to uh, fine tune it as we go along, as we promote the transaction, but it will take time. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so is anyone have any comments or suggestions or anything uh, want to want to ask here? I think this this talk just opened a lot of uh, you know, questions. Uh, I think I, for myself, I think you know, there's a very broad area and bright future for people uh, you know, uh, research in this area. So I, I'm sure you guys are going to have a lot of things to, to ask. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I can I can do uh, my asking my second questions. I think my second questions is about the risk. So um, so what I want to ask: Do you think the emergence of a fintech will be increasing the systematic risk of the whole financial system? If this is the risk, then what's your views about the regulatory uh, sandbox for yeah. this fintech industry? And given this fast growth of the fintech and uh, you know, associated with high risk. So do you think it would be necessary for a fintech industry to be, be more subject to the strict uh, financial regulations similar to the traditional banking sectors? Right. Uh, so in terms of the systematic um, risk, again, uh, as I mentioned at the end, um, at the moment, uh, we don't know much about fintech uh, and the, the impact that has on the financial system is not really significant for now. Now, if we, we just, uh, you know, all the all those research and, and papers talking about uh, these issues, they just, uh, uh, let's say, they, they just not speculate, but they, they just, uh, uh, just uh, talk about, um, you know, what can potentially happen. And when, when we think about the regulation, uh, the financial regulation uh, has been driven generally by this concept of uh, too big, uh, too big to fail bank uh, institutions um, failing can cause a systematic risk. But but um, the same systematic risk can be caused by uh, smaller companies that are everywhere, but they are connected, for example, with the same technology. A problem in this technology can cause several of those, you know, go bankrupt or be unable to, let's say, offer their services. And that can be a source of this uh, systematic risk. So I'm not sure at the moment there is this case, but there is the potential that this can happen. Now, how we, we, we can solve this problem? Making strict, stricter regulations. It, it, it's kind of a big discussion. Um, I'm not sure what will be the, the solution to, to what specific solution you can, you can uh, um, implement to solve this uh, issue. Uh, but, but certainly is one of the areas that uh, as a researcher we need to do to investigate more and need to, to to talk about more. Okay, so do you think they should be treated as the same as the banking sector, or they should be treated differently since they have a uh, they, they, they should be more technology company? Well, they are not a, they're not financial institution, right? Yeah. They have mm -hmm. different balance sheets. They yeah. have different. Uh, um, they, they are completely different structure. Their models are completely different. And mm -hmm. although the way they operate might be efficient, again, they can be uh, a, a source of, uh, uh, a, you know, the easy diffusion of adverse shocks. Now, as I mentioned, um, imagine you're just a, a small fault in an algorithm that uh, has been used by 10,000 or 20 or 100,000 fintech companies providing payments. The same software, the same algorithm. What this can cause? So. No, it's not the same as banks, but they have the, the, the if this is widespread across their industry, yes, they can cause the systematic system, systematic, sorry, risk. Yeah. Okay, so so I see someone uh, raised his hand, Ron. Okay, um, can you ask your questions? 
Uh, yeah, thank you, and 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 thanks to the presenter for 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 covering a lot of ground. Sorry, I should say uh, just a brief introduction. So I'm I'm Ron. I work in the financial sector development team at the F Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office, previously DFID. Um, so the, the, so just a very specific question. They're kind of interlinked. Uh, have you in your research come across any studies that were trying to assess the cost of implementing a regulatory sandbox of some kind? Um, and the reason I ask that is because you know if it is costly i'm assuming it's costly i mean don't have any evidence for that but i'm, I'm imagining it'd be costly to implement um then obviously how realistic is it to expect um you know regulators in a low income setting to adopt some kind of specific regulatory approach to fintech if it actually is quite costly to implement um so that would be my question thanks Thank you, thank you. This is this is actually a great question. Uh, no, there is there aren't actually any particular research that specifically goes about the cost, the cost of, of how to. There are regulatory sandboxes implemented. You know, in UK there is, in uh, developed countries there are, and I'm sure they are expensive. The way they are designed, they they work as schemes, right? For a specific period of time, they invite companies, and the 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 companies enter this and they try their products, and so on. Um, yes, that will be hard for for developing countries. Uh, but as I mentioned, I, I think uh, when I was talking about these different approaches, this is the the innovation incubators is an approach that uh, most of the developed countries are. Uh, are doing at the moment. Uh, in other areas, uh, I think there are regulatory sandboxes in Singapore, uh, I believe, and in other small, uh, in other smaller countries. But there is no um, particular research uh, about the cost. So. It can be possible. I'm, I'm not sure uh, how the uh, the particular governments can uh, find the, the funding about these. Uh, maybe there are programs that uh, fund these or several other um, regulate uh, um, uh, comp firms or investors that uh, are interested, uh, or there are loans regarding this uh, uh, implementation of of regulatory uh, sandboxes. But if you are asking about the cost, no, there there is any such. Maybe it's a good idea as well to to check the costs of a regulated sandbox and try to see uh, how easy it is to implement it or any other um, innovation uh, facilitator uh, approach. Okay, uh, is is Ron anything you want to use on the uh, response or want to add or? Uh, no, no, thank you. I mean, uh, okay. yeah. that, that, yeah. that's all right. I've, I've got to drop off, but thank you very much. Okay. Uh, how about Peter? Yeah. It's your, your new hand, yeah? Yes. Uh, Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Ch thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to come three times. I'm <laughs> so passionate about this subject. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, I'm going to ask a direct to the presenter. Can fintech uh, substitute the role of a bank? I will try and illustrate that with uh, uh, an example. Let's say I go to my bank, uh, I make a, a transfer, then I realize uh, I've made a mistake. I want to reverse uh, this uh, transaction. How can I do it with fintech? And how long does it take? You know. So, likewise, uh, what about because the banks are covered for professional errors? What about fintech? Are they covered for professional errors? So where do we end up uh, bringing our case if there are things that goes wrong? Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Peter. Um, that is an excellent question and really interesting. I think you, you bring uh, into the discussion the aspect of how um, mistakes or any other um, issues that can happen uh, when it comes to technology can be resolved. Um, well, for a fintech to provide banking services, it, as I mentioned, it can have a banking license or not. So I, I, I'm, I'm, you mentioned about doing a transaction and you find 
um, there is no uh, way to uh, you want to change it and uh, your bank you will call your bank and maybe you can change it there but what will happen if this is a fintech um, I can tell you from experience for example when it comes to 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 both banking transactions and when it comes to to monzo and because I have a monzo account and I I, I doing this research if you want I just wanted to see uh, what will happen if I use a digital bank? And I did the transaction, and I, I want them actually to uh, to see what, if I want to reverse it, what I'm going to do. And there are options. Options like uh, you need to send a video of you talking to them with your application in your phone, and they will reply to you. I mean, there is always re uh, ways that you can solve this. Issue. Now, if you talk about the speed, I I, I don't know. I don't I, I don't know how fast a bank can because I, I can I, I can certainly tell you that there is, is, is instances in my bank that will take a lot of time until they uh, they reply to my request. So this can go either way. A bank itself doesn't mean that it's always efficient in handling requests or more efficient in handling requests than a digital bank. Um, of course, there might, if you're talking about their differences, if a fintech company doesn't have a banking license, yes, there is a difference. And the difference comes from the main function of a bank and the maturity transformation that the bank can do. And indeed, a bank, if we want to compare it, might be feel more secure. It, it might be more secure because they have this uh, um, ability to do a better risk management compared to a non-banking fintech company. But most of the digital nail banks, if you want, at the moment operating in the UK, there are quite a, a lot actually. They 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 have gotten banking license so. Effectively, they are banned. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, is anyone have uh, more questions to ask? So, so I have uh, another one. Just, uh, what's your view about the uh, central bank digital currency? So, do you think it will be the future to replace the our paper currency? Right. Uh, okay. So again, um, you ask a question for for an area that I'm, I am very, I am very interested. I was interested many many years ago when I was thinking that uh, you know I was thinking about doing research about a global a global mm -hmm. currency. Yeah. Uh, now you know with the digital currency, uh, it might happen. Now I'm not sure when. What mm -hmm. I know is that a lot of central banks, including the, the, the Bank of England, yeah. they investigate this, and they investigate this very seriously. Now, in China, they have implemented yeah. the, the digital RMB yes. in, in, in three areas. They, they just uh, test it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Sweden, they also talk about the Krona. And they have, I think, uh, they are uh, about introducing, or, or they have already, or they are about to introduce. Now, um, it is not easy. Okay. Because the the the, the, the this um, um, central bank digital currency will not be like a cryptocurrency. Yeah. You wouldn't expect a decentralized structure. Imagine if if. You know, there were the, the central bank digital currency could be used, uh, for example, for illegal activities, and no one could actually monitor what is going on as it happened with Bitcoin. I don't yeah. think any central bank will want this to happen. However, um, there are many different uh, in the paper we try to cover all this, uh, all these aspects. Uh, there are different ways to approach it. Uh, I can mention an idea, for example. A central bank can be the one that is the issuer of the digital currency, 
but you can make actually a, a decentralized structure, but the nodes of this uh, decentralized uh, structure can be other bands. So compare, if you want to compare it with Bitcoin, where you know the verification goes through anonymous computers in the network, the verification of the transaction can go through a group of specified special bands or that they will do this. Okay, so, they, so they, do, they, do you think is it possible uh, will be reducing the role of the US dollar play in the you know, same global uh, you know, currency uh, system? Because currently, I think we rely very much on the US dollar. So uh, if we are saying have this, uh, you know, try to promoting this central bank digital currency, is it some way we are mitigating uh, to rely on on this uh, US dollar? Yeah, I mean, if a digital currency, if, if this happens, we mm -hmm. don't know yet. What, what I can tell you as I mean, a lot of central banks around the world, they do projects on that. They investigate, they are interested in that. Uh, now, this is actually a very good question because you're talking about a currency that is the, one of the reasons why the US is plays that important role, right? Yeah. US yeah. dollar is actually can, 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 yeah, can we can just uh, we can say it is kind of a global currency. Everywhere yeah. you go, if you have dollars, you're fine. Uh, yeah, it, it can potentially uh, uh, it can potentially substitute because of the uh, of the, the, the structure that the virtual currency can have. Now how long this will take whether it will happen immediately or not, it remains to, to, to see, or it actually we want to investigate it. You give very good ideas actually for, for a research paper. <laughs> if you get the characteristics of the US dollar and how it happens and how the potential characteristics of a, a digital currency, uh, what if we put them together and design a theoretical framework, what is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting uh, research questions to do. And we have next uh, um, people, Ross, yeah? Um, so, uh, hi, Peter. Mm, thank yes. you, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. What a coincidence. I know Rose, she's uh, one of my friends. She was okay. at IMF and I was at the World Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great coincidence that we are in uh, together today. But you ask a very important uh, questions. It's about digital currency. You see, the US dollars is a reserve currency. Yeah. Even if you borrow in uh, uh, Swiss francs, you borrow in uh, selling, you borrow in um, euros, at the end of the day, your financial transaction is translated into US dollars. What is the equivalent of debt? If you ask the World Bank for the debt equivalent of uh, the whole world, they'll tell you in US dollars. They can't tell you in euros. So at the end of the day, this is a long shot because I'm sure the Americans, they pride themselves uh, that uh, US dollars is a locomotive currency. This is what uh, uh, makes the world go round. You can go anywhere in the world. They might say, oh, I don't accept uh, euros but I accept dollars. Dollars, it's a hot currency. But this will take quite a long time. Uh, it uh, nevertheless uh, requires a change of mindset, education. So uh, I, I'm sure the uh, investigator will uh, certainly take time to fine tune his uh, paper uh, because there are a lot of answered questions that uh, needs to address. So at least that the paper becomes very, very credible because I'm sure uh, all of us together, we can uh, contribute to our own uh, experience, our own intellectual capacity and uh, fine tune uh, this paper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You have to comment something or. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, again, the um, this is the uh, really I'm I'm really um, I'm really happy about uh, uh, this uh, that that this uh, central uh, digital currency is uh, is an important uh, aspect when it comes to to fintech, and I I, I truly believe that um, it is uh, an area where us as researchers should uh, should. Uh, Talk more about to so investigate more about it, and um, indeed, um, this is an aspect I I, I think uh, I haven't included, and both uh, you and uh, actually Peter, um, the, the you mentioned about the U.S. dollar, and I think we should uh, uh, put it in the paper and uh, try um, in the next version maybe compare it, uh, have a small discussion. Uh, because at the moment, yes, we have we have a currency that is powerful, right? We have the U.S. dollar, and uh, why we should actually, um, why people, why why firms, why why other governments would do we want to transact in a virtual currency when they have the U.S. dollar? So this is the important, some interesting questions to, to to think about and to try to to address. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is any other uh, questions uh, or comments you want to uh, ask? Okay. If no, then uh, probably we can call this the day. Uh, is Peter still old hand yet or new new hand? Hello. Mr. Chairman, thank you so yeah. much. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege that you are according me to raise <laughs> a number of questions. Yeah, I, I see you're quite interested in the I topic. Have no I attention to yeah. Yes, yeah. I, I have. I had no intention to monopolize the floor because <laughs> it's under your chairmanship. Okay. <laughs> but uh, my final, re my final reflection on this uh, paper, mm. I would like to ask uh, the researcher, what is it that he feels that uh, he has brought the paper, it's still missing besides the questions that we've raised, you know. Surely, having come to the conclusion, he might have the gut feeling, oh, I've looked at and I need to fine tune that. That's besides the list of questions that we've raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good cherry. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you for your just participating in all the discussions. I think we have a very uh, wonderful and you know, a successful uh, you know, a seminar today. And thank you for all your coming. Uh, also, especially thanks for the uh, third semis for his very interesting and uh, informative uh, talk about the FinTech. And it's very informative. I think it opened a lot of the uh, window, at least for me to me to think about the, my research and my potential research can be. I think there's too many potential area because it's a new area in the finance, so it's a it's a very very fascinating area to doing the research. So um and thank thanks so much again for the uh, thermos for his very interesting presentation. Okay, and um, I just before we close this uh, seminar, I just try to remind you guys next week we're going to have a professor Joseph uh, Albert from the University of Ghana Business School, and the topic uh, he's going to present is the private capital flows and inclusive finance and the moderating roles of the domestic financial markets and institutions. OK, so uh, I will uh, look forward to seeing all you guys uh, next week uh, for this seminar. I think before I close, I think maybe uh, Thermis will have something to be finished this, uh, these sessions. Yeah. Uh yeah, I, I want also to 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 thank you for this opportunity and uh, the very very good points uh, that uh, were covered. Um, I, I want to particularly thank Peter for for this uh, for this uh, um, for these uh, points he made, and uh, I will try actually to to think more um, about the to, to mention to to highlight more the practical issues uh, when it comes to fintech. And uh, also thank uh, uh, you <laughs> about uh, 
you know these uh, these good uh, good ideas about the the central uh, bank currency and also the uh, systematic risk issues. Um, again, this paper, as you well, we discussed initially, it, it, at the moment is very 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 long. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's more like a collection of of different um, di different um, uh, research. Um, it certainly needs to be fine-tuned, and I think uh, when we'll do that, I will keep in mind all the all the uh, the talent, all the the points you you have today uh, made. So thank you, thank you again. Okay, all right. I just call it there. Thank you so much for the thanks for his very interesting presentation. Okay, um, so see you guys next week. <laughs>